our next speaker, and I just learned this is actually a good thing. She foster failed her asshole cat, right? I just learned that foster failed means that like you failed to get them a new home. You kept took care of them. I thought she like killed the cat, <laughs> right? So she foster failed her, in her words, her asshole cat, who apparently today was really sweet though. And then on top of having this cat, she adopted a 13-year-old dog that doesn't even have eyes. Yeah, that's like really, really sweet. So everyone, please welcome JJ. Yeah. All right, nice to meet everybody. Uh, super excited to be here today uh, and just give you guys a little bit of background of how some sports organizations, teams, and leagues are using data to drive decision-making. Uh, so I wanted to start off on this slide uh, just because today's presentation is going to be drawing from some of my experiences at these different organizations, um, but had the opportunity was working, you know, healthcare and finance before my go to joke was, you know, I was doing the job that I really love data and insights, but it wasn't necessarily an industry I was super excited about and passionate about. Uh, so I was really excited when I had the opportunity to switch over, go and work for the 49ers. I was there for two very, very losing seasons. They actually ended up going to the Super Bowl the year after I left. So I like to say all the work that I did really prepared them for it, you know. Uh, and then I moved over to New York City. I was with the NHL league offices for about four and a half years or short of five years. Uh, and now I've been down here in Orlando. Never thought I'd be living in Florida. Um, but I've been here for about 10 months. I'm the senior director of strategy and analytics over at Orlando City, which encompasses both our men's and women's professional soccer teams. So a lot of my presentation is actually going to be about the work that I did at the 49ers and NHL. Since I've only been there for about 10 months, we're really building up a foundation in Orlando. So diving right into it, the reason I wanted to show this slide is I think it's definitely a misconception. I think before working in sports, I was thinking, oh, they must have 20, 30 people working on business analytics. They probably have a ton of money or doing a lot of crazy things. No. That is not the case. So back in 2016, the 49ers were one of the biggest, if not the biggest analytics team. And you'll see here, there's only seven or eight of us. So not a lot of people necessarily. Uh, so didn't want to spend a lot of time uh, on this slide in particular, but at a very high level, the department was split into two. There's a strategy side and a business analyst, or excuse me, business intelligence side. And the main role of that business intelligence team was really getting data in the right format in the right place at the right time. And then the strategy side, which is what I was on, was then taking that data, starting to find some insights, and then making decisions off of what we were seeing. So also a lot of words on this slide, um, but just a little bit of uh, information about what I had the opportunity to, to work on. So working on our key research programs, putting together event recaps, working on our happy or not terminals, and then also most importantly, which you'll see as a theme kind of throughout my career, is doing a lot of data visualization. So taking all the data, making it pretty. So diving into some of these examples, something that was really important to me when I was working there was on fan research. Uh, so simply put, you know, obviously we would send out surveys to our fans, learning about their experiences. So I joined back in 2015. So looking two years prior to that in 2013, uh, the only way that they were collecting survey data was from something called the NFL Voice of the Fan Study. And that's something that's still going on today. And it was super helpful. Simply put, again, it was just a survey that was going out to all the different teams, season ticket members, and single game buyers. And that was super helpful because we could see, hey, how do our scores, we're getting an eight out of 10 in parking. Is that good? Is that bad? We had no idea. Uh, so to be able to benchmark ourselves against those other teams really helped us put into context some of the results that we were seeing. Um, but the downside of it is it didn't really drill down into the level of detail that we needed. So we could see, hey, our game day entertainment scores came back. We scored a 4.5 out of five. Uh, okay, what about game day entertainment? What was bad? Was it the Wi-Fi? Was it the halftime entertainment? Was it the mascot? Was it something else? And that survey didn't necessarily dive into that detail. So come 2014, they introduced their own surveys. Um, by you know that survey being distributed from the team, you'll see that it went from 6,000 responses for the 2013 season, all the way up to just over 30,000 responses in 2014. Uh, and then the way that that information was then shared back to the organization was in a 15 page report and I counted them there was 109 bar charts, and basically the entire report just looked like that. Uh, I also apologize to anyone who is colorblind I've definitely learned that in my experience, I uh, never use a red to green to gray gradient because I think it's like one out of 10 people can't tell the difference so I apologize, this was my old work i've not made that mistake since. Um, but like I mentioned, I joined the organization in 2015, and we really upgraded and expanded those surveys to pinpoint those areas of feedback. Uh, so the survey did get a little bit longer. Um, so you'll see that that response rate did go down slightly. I think it could be for a couple of reasons. Like I said, 
they weren't winning a lot. So obviously fan engagement is also going down a little bit as well. Um, but again, really started to upgrade, upgrade that survey. So what you'll see on the left-hand side here is basically a map of the, the Wi-Fi scores for a particular, uh, particular game. Uh, and so uh, one of the go-to jokes that my old boss used to say um, was, you know, we would, I think my mic got, oh, we're good. Uh, we went to the head of Stadia operations and said, hey, our Wi-Fi scores were really bad for this game. And his response was, okay, great. Which one of the 5,000 access points should I fix in the stadium? And so now being able to go in, create Wi-Fi scores on a map to say, hey, maybe here's some sections that we should go and check out, really help them out. Then come 2016, just continue to enhance that report with some more data visualizations. I would say they weren't honestly the most fancy, the fanciest things, but something as simple as, hey, let's show security screening scores by gate on a map of all of our gates. Super simple concept. Um, or also just uh, enhancing our section map. So rather than just having kind of dots on the map, let's make it a little bit more visual. One of my personal favorites is you'll have just as many people saying that the music is too loud as people saying that it's too quiet. You're never gonna fix it. Uh, we also had a seat by seat map, which was super helpful. So you could drill down to that level, but uh, not that you take files from things or old work, uh, but I couldn't find that screenshot. Uh, this next one, this is actually, basically just bar charts again, but by just adding something a little bit more visual makes that report much more exciting to look at. So if we're looking at our concession scores, let's show a cute little concession stand so that they can see some of that information. And also call it to myself, I made those. Uh, and then finally, sometimes it's just as simple as adding a picture. Again, it's just a bar chart, it's nothing fancy, but rather than just, as you guys saw on the previous slide, it's just a bunch of bars, let's just add a picture to it. And then finally, this is also a look at our departure times out of our parking lots. And so rather than saying, hey, red lot five did this, red lot three did this, blue lot one did this, now I can see, oh, it's actually maybe some of the further parking lots are, are scoring a little bit lower. So the, the, while the surveys were great, it helped us you know, collect a lot of information, give feedback to people. We really got a push from our executive leadership team to say, hey, this information is great, but I need it sooner. So we were thinking, all right, we send out, we have a, a game on Sunday. We send out the survey Monday morning. We collect the results, put together the report on Tuesday, send everyone the reports by Wednesday. All right, well, maybe we can send out the survey Sunday night right after the game. Maybe pull together the reports a little bit sooner. We'll get it to you by Tuesday night. Still not good enough. And so my boss's boss at the time, his name was Moon. He was going through the airport and you guys might've seen some of these terminals before um, and basically saw one of these happier not terminals at the airport. And it's a super, super simple concept. I'm sure you guys have seen them um, as well, but it's just basically four different smiley faces prompted with a really simple question. Uh, how was your concessions experience today? So it doesn't give you a lot of context into why that person's concessions experience was good or bad, but you'll see that we had 280,000 responses in just one and a half seasons. Uh, we even broke Happier Not's record of single responses on a terminal within a day. Um, but basically we placed them, we had 120 terminals, placed them in our concessions, our gates, guest, uh, guest services and bathrooms. Um, and like I said, it's not a lot of detail, but by getting those alerts every 15 minutes, I worked with Happier Not to develop their first mobile app. We we're able to push a push notification to that stakeholder to say, hey, go check out that area. And again, while not really detailed, you could go over there and pretty quickly figure out what was wrong. You know, the bathroom was dirty, the concession sign uh, line was long, the hot dogs, you know, they ran out of hot dog bones or something like that. And so it was just really helpful to in real time pinpoint those areas of feedback. That being said, we would be remiss to say, obviously, fan experience and, uh, or excuse me, fan satisfaction and on field performance definitely relate to each other. I think we'll always say, you know, the beers are colder, the hot dogs are warmer when you're winning. Um, and so one of the things that you'll see on this slide, and I'll play, uh, press play in just a second, but on the left hand side, is a match that we played against Dallas, boo, I'm an Eagles fan, uh, where we, we ended up losing that, that game. And on the right-hand side is when we played the Jaguars. And as you'll see, both of these games started at the same time. And again, apologize for the red to green, um, but you'll see on the left-hand side, these are all of our uh, concession stands for that match. You'll start to see a lot more red on the left-hand side as they're losing and losing a little bit more. <laughs> I'll also say that um, pieces of advice, or probably the biggest piece of advice, if you see these terminals in a bathroom, do not touch them. They are the dirtiest things <laughs> ever. 
Um, but at a high level, one of my goals was to start to measure, hey, what was that impact on on-field performance on fan satisfaction? Uh, so this was just a wireframe of a dashboard I started to put together so we could see based on our win probability, based on the score of the game, how are our happy or not scores trending? So that eventually we could come to a number. Hey, fans are 10% more pissed off when we're losing a game about things that have nothing to do with it or things like that. So unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to figure out what that number was because I switched over to look uh, work for the NHL league offices. And so Pre-2021, I think, I forget what year it was. I think I joined in 2018, 2019. I was part of what was called the club business and analytics team. And it was a department that really started out of the finance department uh, and started as a reporting arm of the business. So we're taking a lot of information, especially from our CFO, building that into the reports. Then what we started to learn was there was a ton of other people within the organization that was doing analytics, but necessarily weren't learning best practices from each other. So Post 2021, uh, we created basically a centralized uh, analytics team, which was called our fan engagement and analytics team. And I was part of this little arm over here, which is called our FISA team, which I'll show you that layout in just a second. But you see there's fan engagement strategy, growth marketing, ticketing analytics, club strategic initiatives. Now we're bringing that all under one umbrella underneath our CMO, Heidi Browning, who's a super awesome person. So going into FISA, uh, which is a ton of buzzwords and probably the longest title that I'll ever have. Uh, but it's basically fan intelligence strategy and analytics. Basically, we were doing data, uh, business data. Uh, and so you'll see I was a senior manager of FISA at the time. We also had someone working on digital and social analytics. Probably one of the smartest people I ever meet was our manager of quantitative analytics and then ticketing analytics and fan analytics as well. So I worked on a ton while I was at the league, uh, Was loved all the work that I got to do. I got to translate some of that survey work that I was doing at the 49ers and now do it at a league-wide level. Uh, did a lot of data visualization. I ran our Tableau organizational strategy. And then my favorite thing was actually our in, uh, in, in, uh, excuse me, in market club visits. So the, getting the opportunity to come in town, meet with the team, see what they're doing and work out with them, figure out best practices, create conferences like this. We're bringing all of our NHL clubs together. It was a lot of fun. But what was my baby when I was there it was something called the Ticket Buyer Trends Study. And it's a very, very lengthy word. Basically, it was a survey that went out all to, uh, to all of our club season ticket members and single game buyers, but we really wanted to focus specifically on the people who were purchasing tickets to our, uh, to our games. So who are they? Why were they purchasing tickets in the first place? If they're a season ticket member, what drove that decision? Uh, are they going to renew their tickets next year? And the beauty of this project is that our clubs could then see, it's basically the NFL Voice of the Fan Study at the NHL. Uh, and so all of our clubs could see the results for every single club across the entire 32 clubs that were that were in the league. Um, and we really wanted to design the study to also go over time. So not only, hey, what's that snapshot of that year, but how are things changing, especially coming out of COVID? It was really interesting to see pre-2020, what were the results, what were the trends, and then what were we seeing afterwards as well. Uh, it was a beast of a project for sure. It was actually completely optional for our clubs to participate. Uh, so definitely hang my hat on that we were able to get all 32 clubs to participate in this study. Uh, so we uh, just in the 2021 season, well, technically 2021, 2022, since we go over two years, uh, we collected over 165 sample files uh, after deduping, cleaning all of the data. We ended up sending just uh, short of a million surveys, uh, got about 100,000 surveys back. And then my favorite part of the job was then taking all of that data building presentation and finding all of those insights. So I also counted these ones, but there was just short of about 7,000 slides just that season uh, for 58 custom club presentations as well as league-wide presentations as well. So some of, the, some of the information I have to share with you guys today are from some of the end of season results of that 2021-2022 season. Um, but starting off, uh, just explaining in case anyone doesn't know what net promoter score is, it's a pretty simple concept, but basically it's a question that's within a survey and it just says, how likely is it that you would recommend a specific brand, team, whatever it might be, to a friend, family member, or colleague? Pretty simple question. And it's a question on a zero to 10 scale. So if someone gives it a nine or a 10, that means that they're a promoter of your product. Uh, that means, you know, if they're going out, they're talking about their brand or excuse me, your brand, they're saying something positive. They're a promoter of your specific brand. They're seven, eight, they're a little bit more passive. They might say something positive. They might say something negative. And then anyone is six or below is someone who would be a detractor. That means they're most likely going to say something negative. And net promoter score is basically a score from a, um, 
a range of negative 100 to 100. And you calculate that by taking the percentage of promoters and subtracting the percentage of detractors. Uh, and so, for example, if you get a score of 100, that means everyone gave you a 9 or a 10. If you get a score of a negative 100, that means everyone rated you 6 and below. If you get a score of 0, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone scored you a 7 and an 8. That just means you had an equal number of people saying that they were a promoter uh, uh, as they were a detractor. So I wanted to give that background a little bit before we hop into some of these slides. Uh, so this is looking at the net promoter score. Uh, in purple is the 2019-20 season uh, average score. And then the other bars are basically the four different ways we sent throughout that season. Because obviously we don't want to just start at the start of the uh, season or the end of the season. Because like we mentioned, team performance is going to impact some of those scores, even though the question has nothing to do about team performance sometimes. And so you'll see, unfortunately, there was good news and bad news. So bad news was that the, the net promoter score did go down from the 2019-20 season. But the good news is it didn't keep going down. So it remained pretty consistent throughout those, those four different waves. Then the fun part about this data is that we can slice and dice it a ton of different ways. And so when we would put together these presentations, uh, basically we would put together for every single question, the overall results, also this slide. So those are results by different demographics, and then also a slide to see those by uh, each individual club as well. And so you'll see uh, there's four different kind of areas that we focused in on demographics, gender, generation, ticket type, and country. Um, and this is definitely a theme that we saw across the board on almost all of our questions. And by that, I mean, for gender, females were always had a higher uh, satisfaction than males. Younger generations had a higher satisfaction. Our single game buyers uh, scored as higher than our season ticket members did, which obviously is not great. And then U.S. residents uh, had a higher satisfaction compared to Canadian residents. That was for a couple of reasons, I think, but obviously we're coming out of COVID as well. Uh, and especially for some of our Canadian markets, coming back after that year was, was definitely super tough. So then the fun part also is we can cut this by a ton of different ways. So we can cut it by other survey questions, uh, seat location, other TBTS questions by club. And so I have a couple of examples to share with you guys today and a little bit of a quiz actually. So if we look first by season ticket member, uh, net promoter score by tenure. So the number of seasons that they've been a season ticket member. How many people think if you've been a season ticket member for longer, so you have longer tenure, maybe 20 years, you have a higher net promoter score than someone who's a rookie account? Nobody? All right. Good job. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, our rookie accounts, interestingly enough, had a higher satisfaction compared to some of our older season ticket members. But it's actually kind of interesting because in sports, your most risky accounts, aka the people who are least likely to renew, are actually your rookie accounts. Uh, so there's a lot of other factors that go into it. So it's it's actually kind of fun because you get all the old, like the older season ticket members are like, I hate this, everything sucks, I'm not going to renew. They end up renewing anyways. <laughs> uh, this next one, net promoter score by ticket price. So who thinks someone who paid more for their tickets had a better experience or a higher net promoter score? All right, probably like two, three people. All right, the majority was right. Uh, so the good news, well, the bad news actually, is that our highest paying season ticket members had the lowest net promoter score. Again, bad news, if the people that are paying the most, the most money are the least satisfied, not great for our industry. And then this, uh, this last one, well, I have one more, but this is the last quiz. Uh, uh, single game buyer net promoter score by based on where they sit in the arena. So if you think Raise your hand if you think if they sat closer to the ice, aka they were in the lower bowl, they had a higher satisfaction. Uh, maybe like a quarter-ish of the room. Joke's on you guys. It doesn't make a difference. So interestingly enough, it was actually pretty flat based on where you're sitting uh, within the arena. And then talking about how we were really taking this information to drive decision making at our clubs, this is looking at net promoter score by all of our different uh, ticket packages. So Something that we say in sports and we're trying to understand is, is the season ticket package dead? Especially in the NHL when there's 41, 45 games, the reality of someone coming to all those games is not, is, is not likely. And so you'll see here our full season ticket uh, members have the lowest net promoter score. And then it starts to go up once you get into those smaller packages with our quarters and minis being the most satisfied. But you'll see we actually at the time had eight clubs who weren't offering quarter season ticket packages. So we could then take this information go into those eight markets and say, hey, do you realize that that has a high satisfaction, but you don't offer that? And maybe we should start to split up rather than offering 41 games, maybe 11 game plan, for example. 
I'd also be remiss to say net promoter score is not the only way to measure fan satisfaction. Um, so you'll see actually on the left-hand side that net promoter score, like we, we saw, it went down year over year. But we also asked about overall game day satisfaction and actually increased year over year. And so it's really important as you're developing surveys is not just look at it in one form or fashion, cut this data by a bunch of different ways and also ask a different questions about overall satisfaction. My favorite and least favorite question is asking about season ticket member value because value means so many different things to so many different people. And I know I only have 19 seconds left, but luckily this is the shortest part of my presentation. Um, Stepping into what I kind of oversee now, we have kind of three main areas. So market intelligence is basically our internal consultants for our marketing and our partnerships team. Uh, business intelligence is basically our main stakeholders for our ticket sales and service team, uh, overseeing our CRM as well. And then finally, ticket operations. They are the unsung cures of sports organizations. If they did not exist, no one would ever get their tickets. Um, but one of our main focuses as we're getting started, again, our only uh, department has only existed for about 10, 11 months, uh, is building a really good foundation and building out our report catalog. So over the last 10 months, our team has been super hard at work, basically putting together all of these different reports, and there's still a ton more to come. I wish I had more time to present some of these, um, but just showing a little bit of insight of now with our team joining, this was our renewal report uh, for the last couple of seasons. It was basically just a, you know, kind of a plain spreadsheet. Now with our team coming in, understanding the, the value uh, and power of Tableau, we can take that chart and then instead create this, which is just a much more visual way to look at some of this data. So our ticket sale or our VP of ticket sales and service can go in and see, all right, we're on the 21st day of renewal. We've lost X number of seats, but we're still pacing behind the last three years, which is really great news. Um, don't have enough time to, to cover this slide, but just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, I love going through all of this data. I could talk about it for probably hours. This actually used to be an hour long presentation, so it was nice to kind of cut it down to 20 minutes. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hope you guys learned, uh, learned a little bit just how we're looking at this in sports. So thank you.